Okay. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to share our uh, research about the aqueous organic redox flow batteries for the renewable energy storage. My name is Jian Luo from Utah State University. Recently, I'm a postdoc in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Actually, my research re uh, field <clears throat> mainly focuses on the development of redox uh, materials and uh, for the uh, applications in the uh, energy storage and the uh, catalysis. Uh, specifically, we develop redox uh, active materials, for example, redox moleculars for aqueous organic redox flow batteries and uh, electrolytes for the rechargeable magnesium batteries and the organic redox uh, materials for photosynthesis and the redox uh, materials for the electrosynthesis. Today, I will talk about the first part we develop the redox molecules for aqueous organic redox flow batteries. Um, yeah, recently, the electricity generation in the US is mainly from the natural gas and the, and the core. Um, however, to uh, overcome the environment and the energy challenges, in the future, the government want to increase the uh, percentage of the renewable energy. For example, at by uh, 2050, we will have uh, more than 30% of the electricity generated from the renewable energies. Uh, for all the renewable energies right now, mostly come from the hydrogen electric or the uh, wind, but in the future, the percentage of the solar energy and the wind will increase. And uh, for example, at uh, 2050, the uh, solar energy will be about 50% uh, of the of uh, all the renewable energy, and actually it will be about 15% uh, of the overall electricity generation. Here is uh, the potential of the uh, solar energy in the US. Actually, you can see they are mainly uh, at the southeast, uh, southwest part of the US and the Florida. But if you compare with the electricity uh, consumption, actually the consumption are mainly at the east part of the US. So, if we uh, generate the electricity at the west, we need to pump to the east to uh, supply the uh, usage. At the same time, in a single day, the solar uh, production is mainly at the middle of the day. However, the peak of the electricity usage is at the afternoon or the evening. So there is a a uh, time gap and of about four hours or six hours. So it is uh, the challenges for the uh, development of the uh, renewable energy. For example, this solar energy is uh, the space and the time mismatch of the uh, solar energy harvest and the consumption. So it asks us to develop advanced technology for no cost and large scale energy storage. And you can say um, in the future, there will be a very big market for the energy storage. For example, uh, by 2040, there will be a demand of 942 gigawatt energy storage uh, in the world. Actually, it will be uh, six, uh, 624 billion US dollars market. And about at that time, the US will need 160 gigawatts of, uh, uh, of the energy storage. It is uh, more than 23 uh, grand uh, Kuni dams. It is a very huge demand for uh, the energy storage and the current uh, Technologies cannot meet such a rapid growing demand for this uh, energy storage. 
So we want to develop the redox uh, flow batteries to supply this demand. Actually, here is the structure of the redox flow battery. You can see the battery uh, was have uh, several parts. The middle part actually is the battery stock. It has uh, two electrodes and uh, two chamber, the green one and the purple one. Actually, those, those chambers are the, uh, the, uh, the liquid phase energy storage material will flow in and out and the uh, redox reaction will happen at the surface of the electrode. Between those two chambers, there will be an ion selective membrane. So the, uh, from the uh, ion conductive membrane to balance the charge of uh, negative chamber and the positive chamber. This is the battery stock port. And the outside of the battery, there are two tanks. Those two tanks are the container for the uh, energy storage solutions. And um, uh, here is a pump. The pump can uh, pump the solution in and out the battery stock and make the uh, energy storage materials continuously flow through the battery. And uh, actually the real uh, flow battery have Many have those with several parts. Here is the electronite tanks. And the, uh, at the bottom, and the, the top side is the uh, battery cell. And at the and at bottom, there is a pump to make the electronite flow. And the other side, there is a control system. During the battery uh, charge discharge at the other side, the anodite, the anode side material um, solution, we call it anodite, will be uh, reduced uh, at the charge uh, process or uh, oxidized back at the discharge uh, process. And the cathode side solution, we call it uh, cathodite. It will be um, oxidized at the charge process or uh, to reduce back at the discharge uh, process. So the charge and during the charge and the discharge process, the materials were oxidized or reduced at the uh, negative chamber or positive chamber. So the energy can be stored and output it. The most important parameters for this um, uh, flow battery is uh, as the first one is the cell voltage. Actually, it is a very simple. The cell voltage is uh, uh, equals to the uh, potential gap between the uh, redox potential of the anodite and the cationite. And the another most important uh, parameter is the energy uh, density. It is is determined by the number of the electrons involved into the redox reaction and the concentration of the uh, electronite and uh, the uh, cell voltage. Also, the uh, the volume ratio of the anodate and the cathodate. So, based on this uh, uh, battery structure, the, the uh, there is a remarkable advantages for this uh, battery. Set up. For example, it has a separated energy and the power because in this battery, the, the, the energy capacity is uh, determined by the volume or size of the tank, uh, electronite tank. But the power input and output is determined by the size of the electrode. So that means if we want to increase the capacity of the battery, we just need to use a larger tank to keep the electronite. But if we want to make the uh, battery more powerful, we just need to increase the size of the battery stack. So this makes the battery have excellent maturity and scalability. And because the, uh, the energy storage materials are solution and it was uh, flow through the 
surface of the electrode. So it can overcome the mass transport of the uh, energy materials during the redox reactions. So it can give us a very fast electrochemical chemical reactions and then give us a good power and energy performance. For example, the battery usually it can uh, it can deliver more uh, several hundred millivolt per square centimeter of power density, and the battery can be operated at uh, high uh, current uh, density, um, usually more than uh, several hundred milliampere per square centimeter. And if we choose uh, cheap energy storage materials, this battery can be uh, very low cost for the energy storage. This is an example of the a small scale redox flow battery. In you can see this uh, this uh, wire and this wire is the tank we used to keep our electrolyte. And this the middle one is a battery stack, and in the back it is the pump to flow the electrolyte. And this one is a middle sized uh, flow battery. Uh, demonstrated uh, in the lab, you can see they are they have several chambers connected to, it, to each other. They can supply much higher uh, voltage and the, uh, two big tanks for the electrolyte. And here is the pump to make the electrolyte uh, flow. Here is a picture of real redox flow batteries in uh, set up in the uh, in our cities you can see the tanks are very big and the battery uh, stacks are also huge uh, actually traditionally the uh, people use the inorganic uh, redox uh, materials for as the energy storage uh, material in the uh, flow batteries there are several uh, examples. For the first one is the palladium uh, redox flow batteries. They use the palladium uh, four and the five uh, couple as the uh, cathodite, and the palladium three and the two as the analyte. So the whole uh, voltage for the battery is 1.25 volt. The advantage for this palladium battery is the for the, they have a very high current and power performance because this battery was set up using, usually use three uh, more sulfonic acid as the supporting electrolyte. So under this uh, strong acidic conditions, the uh, conductivity of the uh, electrolyte is very high. So it can give a very good current and power performance. And actually another, advantage for the palladium batteries. The cathodite and the anodite, they both use the palladium as the uh, active materials. So we don't need to worry about the crossover effect because even if it was a crossover, we can just uh, combine the cathodite and the anodite, then uh, recharge the, uh, reset the battery again because all the uh, palladium elements is not consumed during the charge discharge. But the this one uh, advantage for the palladium battery is uh, the high cost uh, of the palladium because the palladium is a uh, kind of uh, expensive and also because you need to use the strong acid and the electrolyte. So it is a cross and also the crossover of the palladium will make the capacity decay. Um, but the um, uh, so every several cycles, we need to combine the uh, anodite and the cathodite and then refresh the battery again. So actually, the crossover will make the battery uh, uh, decay, but the decay can be recovered. This is both the advantage and the disadvantage of the palladium battery. As another example is the iron chromine uh, flow battery. The cathode side, we use the 
iron two, iron three redox couple, and the analyte we use the chromine two, chromine, uh, chromine two, chromine three. The overall cell voltage is one point one eight volt. The advantage for this battery is the no cost materials because both the iron and the chromine are much cheaper than the uh, palladium. But the disadvantage for this uh, battery is the electrochemical kinetics of the chromine redox is kind of slow. So usually we need to use uh, a pressure matter as the catalyst to uh, promote a fast redox of the um, uh, chromine. And it will increase the cost of the, uh, the battery. And also, this battery usually is set up at uh, acidic conditions. So some side reactions, for example, the hydrogen evolution reactions will happen and affect the, um, the Columbic efficiency of the battery and makes the battery uh, unstable. Also, the crossover of the iron chitin and the chromine chitin will also affect the uh, stability of the battery because uh, on this uh, iron chromine battery, the anode side use chromine, cathode side use iron. So the crossover of any of these uh, materials will damage the battery. So it is the biggest, actually, it is the biggest disadvantage of the iron chromine redox flow battery. Another one is the zinc bromine redox flow battery. The cathode side use the bromide bromine a redox copper, and the, the <coughs> anode side may use the zinc deposition stripping as the, uh, uh, for the uh, energy storage. The overall uh, by cell voltage is 1.82 volt. It is very high. And the advantage for the zinc bromine battery is uh, no cost materials because uh, both zinc and uh, bromine are very normal chemicals. And uh, the highest mobility of the zinc bromine uh, compound in water, it will give a high energy density and a high voltage because it is around 1.82 volt. Actually, it is the highest among most of the um, redox flow batteries. The, but the disadvantage is, the first one is the safety concern because you can see at the cancer side, it will generate the bromine. The bromine is uh, toxic and uh, very corrosive, especially because it have a no boiling point and a high vapor pressure. Also, the crossover of the bromine will be a big problem because you can see the bromine actually it is charge neutral. So it is even more easier crossover than the, the palladium or, uh, or the iron chromine uh, in the iron conductive uh, or uh, membrane or the iron selective membranes. Uh, another uh, problem for this, uh, this battery is the zinc dendrite because if we charge uh, uh, discharge the battery under high current densities, usually the uh, zinc dendrite will form and it will break the membrane and then damage the battery. Uh, also because the zinc need to dissolve in acidic uh, solutions to avoid the hydronize. So the hydrogen uh, evolution reaction will happen, especially you can see it has has a high voltage, so it will be pushes a negative for zinc deposition stripping uh, a potential to very low, a uh, very negative. So it will make the high evolution very uh, quick and uh, affect the battery efficiency. But uh, among all of the um, uh, inorganic redox flow batteries, actually the palladium uh, redox flow batteries is the um, uh, is the most robust and well developed. For example, this one is a picture of a two uh, megawatt uh, palladium flow battery set up a, a project set up at California, US. And this is a picture of a three megawatt um, palladium uh, flow battery set up at uh, Hubei, China. 
and uh, there are several uh, even larger uh, projects are uh, undergoing. It will be come out in a couple of uh, years. But in our uh, research, we want to overcome the disadvantages of this uh, you know, organic uh, redox flow batteries to use the organic electronic materials because the organic uh, electronic materials usually um, just uh, have uh, no uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, or nitrogen, those common elements. So it is potentially no cost and uh, sustainable. And also the organic uh, materials, the structure is uh, very, uh, is highly trainable. So we can turn the structure and uh, optimize the performance of the uh, batteries. So in our work, we are interested in the increased organic redox flow batteries because uh, can, uh, the aqueous solution, it uh, has uh, advantages, for example, safety uh, features, because the water solution, it cannot catch fire. And uh, because the uh, water solution usually have much higher conductivity than non-aqueous uh, solutions, so it can give uh, high power densities. So that's why we are interested in the aqueous organic redox flow batteries. Here, yeah, first, uh, we uh, noticed that the biology compound actually it, uh, is a uh, uh, very common use the molecular. The biology is a class of bipyridinium uh, bi dichitin compounds. The structure shows up here. Shows here. And the, the most famous uh, biology, uh, I think it is uh, uh, paraquate. The paraquate is a uh, dimethyl biology, and it is uh, widely used in the agriculture as a uh, heat kit. Um, and uh, the biology compounds were so used by uh, Professor Stoddart in his. Uh, molecular uh, machine. For example, they use, uh, he made this, uh, this uh, molecular shuttle in uh, 1990s and uh, used this uh, because of this, uh, fam this famous works. He won the 2016 uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry. And actually the uh, mesobiology compound, it is a redox active it has uh, two redox events. The first one, it can be reduced to a monokaitan radical, and it can be further reduced to a charge neutral molecular. The CV of this compound shows up shows here. In, this is the CV in water. You can see the first uh, redox peak, it is uh, fairly reversible. However, the second one is uh, irreversible. It is because the, the two electron reduced state, it is a charge neutral, so it cannot be dissolved in water. And uh, this, um, it makes the second redox more like uh, the, uh, the uh, metal deposition stripping. So it, this metal allergen can only be used as a single electron storage materials in the aqueous. Uh, uh, redox flow batteries. To, uh, in order to use the second electron, we uh, designed a new compound. We add a charged uh, ammonium group on the pendant arms of the biology and also add a electron withdrawing group, uh, conjugation group into the bipyridin uh, rings. Then we can get a compound, and the CV shows up like here. You can see firstly, yeah, in the presence of those two ammonium group, uh, even the second electron reduction, it can be very reversible. And also because of the electron withdrawing group in the uh, between those two pyridinium rings. It makes the second electron redox shifted to the more positive side. 
and makes those uh, two elect two redox events almost uh, overlapped. And uh, we uh, compare uh, and uh, we paired with the redox active tempo catalyte. In total, we can get 1.44 volt uh, gap between the anode and the uh, cathode. So use this uh, uh, redox PR, we tried a 0.5 more uh, battery. Actually, this battery showed good uh, current performance at, uh, at current density between 40 to 100. And we also showed the good uh, uh, capacity retention. Actually, uh, you can see after uh, in 300 uh, charge discharge cycles, we obtained the 99.97% capacity retention per cycle. But the problem is under this peer, we need to use the organic uh, compound tempo and the cathodite. Okay, the tempo compound is kind of expensive. So we want to utilize the inorganic cathodites because, for example, the iodine, the bromide, or the cyanide, those compounds are very uh, common chemicals and very cheap. But uh, the problem is these compounds are negative charge, negatively charged. So we need to make our virgin compounds also negatively charged. Because yeah, in that case, we can use the ionine exchange membrane to make sure the virgin and the, uh, the cationite will not cross over. So we synthesize that this uh, sulfonate function functionalized the biology. In the middle, it is the bipyridinium bi compound. It is positive charged, positively charged. At the uh, end side, there are uh, negatively charged uh, uh, sulfonate groups. So the DFT completion shows up like that. The negative charge are at the uh, end, uh, out. Uh, side of the molecular and then in the middle side it is the positively charged and uh, uh, you can see this molecular can show a uh, strong repulsion uh, with the channel of the cation, uh, with the cation exchange membranes because in the uh, channel of the cation ex exchange membrane there is a lot of negatively charged sulfonate so it's uh, it can make sure the uh, sulfonate functionalized biology it be difficult to cross over the channel of the uh, the cation exchange membrane. Even this direction, it can also show efficient uh, <coughs> repulsion to uh, avoid the molecular into the uh, cation exchange membrane. And first, uh, we uh, tested the stability of the sulfonate functionalized uh, biology use a symmetric uh, half cell battery. Uh, actually, under this battery uh, setup, we use uh, uh, the mixture of a charge uh, one to one ratio, charges, uh, charged state and the discharged state uh, uh, compound as the electrolyte in both the negative side and the positive side. So this battery can be uh, cycled uh, and then at the positive side and ne negative side, both reactions are the biology redox. So even tiny amount of uh, decomp uh, decomposition will show large uh, capacity decay. So this is the advantage of the uh, half cell battery test because it can room in the uh, the decomposition of the uh, materials. As you can see in 500 cycles, the battery showed a very good uh, stability, 100% capacity retention. So that means in 500 charge discharge cycles, no uh, biology compound uh, decomposed was uh, observed. Then we paired, first paired with the 
uh, plasma iodine. This uh, pill can give us uh, one volt uh, cell voltage. And uh, we uh, tried a uh, 0.5 more flow battery. We can get 99.99% capacity retention per cycle and up to 71% energy efficiency. And uh, also uh, more than 90 uh, more, uh, mini volt per square centimeter. Uh, power density. To further increase the um, energy density, we tried to pair it with the uh, ferrocyanide. Because the proverse one, the iodide also showed the crossover in the membrane. So the uh, stability is still not uh, perfect. And then we tried to use the ferrocyanide because ferrocyanide both charge state and the discharge state, they are highly negatively charged. But the problem is the normal sodium sort or the plasma sort, the solubility is no, it is less than 0.8 more completion. So we did the cation exchange to synthesize the ammonium sort. You can see after cation, ammonium sort showed uh, can uh, show the solubility almost uh, uh, more than doubled. And then we can set up a high completion uh, battery, give us a high energy density. This pair can give us uh, about uh, 0.82 volt cell voltage. And uh, here is a 0.9 more redox flow battery. Under this condition, we can achieve around the 10 watt hour per meter energy density. You can see after 1,000 uh, charge discharge cycles, no capacity decay. It uh, is one of the most uh, stable uh, redox flow battery reported uh, recently. And this uh, flow battery, we also had to operate uh, with a solar panel. You can see we use a, a piece of 1.2 uh, volt uh, solar panel. It can uh, smoothly charge the battery and uh, we can uh, we, uh, discharge the battery. It is uh, kind of uh, stable. And uh, we also tried to uh, test uh, the stability under uh, real conditions. For example, we tried the a storage uh, the stability of the battery under 0.5 more and 0.9 more. This one, we charge the battery and directly uh, discharge the battery is the dash nine. If we charge the battery and uh, keep the battery for 30 days and then discharge the battery is the 49. So you can see you after uh, 30 days storage, there are more than 95% capacity retention. So that means that after 30 days, there is only, uh, there is uh, less than 5% capacity uh, lost. So it is uh, uh, very stable. It can meet our real uh, use. To further increase the uh, uh, energy density, we try to combine it with the uh, ammonium bromide because the ammonia, the, uh, the bromide redox is a very high voltage, uh, high uh, potential at 1.08 volt. So this pier can give us 1.51 volt cell voltage. And then um, we can get a very good cycling performance. It, and the, the uh, energy density of this uh, battery is very high. You can see we can get uh, more than one, uh, more than 200 millivolt per square centimeter energy density. But the problem is the bromine crossover uh, uh, happened in this uh, flow battery. So we cannot uh, do a non cycling test. Uh, it, uh, it is worth to note that this battery will be uh, demonstrated at 1.5 more. So it is. Uh, more than 30 uh, watt hour per liter. It is uh, much higher than the commercial 
uh, vanadium redox flow battery. You, the typical redox uh, the vanadium redox flow battery is only about uh, 20 to 25 uh, volt, hour, uh, uh, volt hour per meter. So here we can achieve 30 watt hour per meter. So here we use this violin, a negatively charged violin, we paired with the iodine, free cyanide, and the bromide. We can achieve uh, <coughs> low cost, high voltage, and high energy density, and high power density uh, uh, aqueous uh, flow batteries. So um, um, besides the uh, anode uh, night, we also uh, developed the cash night for the uh, aqueous re redox flow batteries. The, uh, first, uh, the first one actually it is one of the most uh, famous uh, organic uh, organometallic uh, compounds. It contains uh, one iron in the middle and two CP ligands at the bottom and the top. It is it's a safety uh, compound. And the uh, hormone of this compound is mainly uh, come from the 3D orbital of the iron. So the redox of the uh, first thing actually it is uh, between the iron 2 and the iron 3. And the, the potential is at uh, 0.4 volt with the NHE because this kind of uh, safety compounds, Professor Fisher and uh, Vertising uh, uh, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry at uh, 1973. So we want to utilize the freezing and the catalyte in for the uh, redox flow batteries. So, but the problem is the freezing itself you cannot dissolve in water. So we uh, introduced. Uh, uh, hydrophonic uh, ammonium groups into the first compound, and we gradually adjusted the, uh, the uh, chain between the ammonium and the first from one carbon, two carbon, and uh, two, three carbon. And uh, this compound shows a good uh, solubility in water. For example, of those three compounds, Show the uh, more than two more uh, solubility in water, and because of the charged uh, uh, groups involved into the introduced into the molecular, this molecular show the good uh, conductivity in the water solutions, and worse, and uh, with the extent of the uh, uh, carbon chain, we can see the. Redox potential of those three compounds gradually shifted to the negative directions. But the uh, electrochemical kinetics, for example, the charge transfer constant and uh, the diffusion uh, constant are um, higher or comparable with the normal inorganic uh, redox molecules. So, First, uh, we use the um, MR to start it, the, those three compounds. You can see with the carbon chain extended, the, um, the proton signal of the, the uh, protons on the uh, PC, uh, well, on the CP ligand, are shifted from high chemical shift to lower chem chemical shift. That means uh, with the extent of the carbon chain, the, the functional groups are turned from a strong electron withdrawing group to a, a slightly electron donating groups. And also we can see the uh, UV's absorption slightly shift with the, uh, with the carbon chain extension. So here is the IR spectrum of this of these three compounds. The first one we can see two peaks of the iron CP strength. Actually, those two peaks come from those two different CP ligands. And if we extend the carbon chain to two 
carbon and three carbon. You can see those those peaks are over, overlapped and shifted to the larger wave numbers. Finally, it further shift to even larger wave numbers. And here, there are two, uh, divided to two peaks again. It uh, is come from those two different uh, uh, CP ligand. So those peaks shifted to larger wave numbers. That tells us the uh, the iron CP uh, coordination gets stronger. So, and we also used the half cell uh, flow battery to study the stability of these uh, those three compounds. You can see the stability of those three compounds are very significant. The the first one with strong electron withdrawing group, it is. Uh, um, the capacity decay is very fast after uh, 13, uh, after about 13 days. We lost uh, more, uh, about 25% of the capacity, but the green one with three carbon, uh, C3 <coughs> carbon linkage, it is the most stable. After 13 days, it only lost about 2% uh, uh, of the capacity. Study the studied uh, the, the, uh, decomposition mechanism of this uh, uh, compound. We first tested the thermal induced de degradation of the charged state uh, C1 freezing compound. Because this one, the decomposition is the, fast, uh, is the most uh, the fastest. So we tested it first. And you can see the charged state compound uh, after 24 days, we can see the UV based absorption decayed a lot. So we proposed the, the, the decomposition mechanism like that. The, this one, because it has a very strong electron withdrawing group, so it makes the coordination of the CP ligand to the R3 weak. And uh, it gives uh, the chance to a uh, water molecule to attack the iron center, and uh, then the iron, uh, the the CP ligand can be polarized by the water molecules, and uh, finally it will uh, dissociate it from the iron center, and more water will coordinate with the iron. Finally, the second CP ligand will dissociate and generate the iron hydroxide and the uh, free CP ligand. Actually, we do uh, see the iron hydroxide precipitate generate, and also we detected the formation of the free CP ligand by the GC and the GC mass. Another uh, uh, degradation pathway we found is uh, Photo-induced uh, degradation of this compound because when we put this compound under the night irradiation, we can see the decomposition of at both discharge state and the charge uh, charged state. You can see in uh, 24 days uh, the discharge state uh, compound it can uh, we can see significant uh, uh, decay of the UV based absorption. The same thing happened. Actually, it's even faster at the charged state. So, the, the, this so we found this uh, the thermal and uh, those thermal and the photo induced the CP ligand uh, dissociation degradation pathways. And uh, the cyclic stability of the state of the um, uh, first compound actually it is mainly limited by the charged state. Because the photo induced this degradation, actually, it is very easy to overcome. We just need to set up the rack, the, the battery under the dark. And the electron donating groups can stabilize the first molecules because previously we introduced that the C3 pendant arm can make the 
uh, coordination between the CP ligand and the iron stronger. So that is how the electron donating groups liberalize the first in molecules. So with this uh, uh, <clears throat> knowledge is in hand, we developed uh, uh, first in compound, uh, negatively charged the first in compound, this one. We have uh, two electron donation, uh, this three chain uh, pendant arms on the first in compound. And this compound, it have uh, negatively charged uh, sulfonyl groups. So we uh, uh, combine it with the zinc chitin and make this uh, zinc sort. So this zinc sort, we can use it as the bipolar molecules because at the negative side, we can utilize the zinc for the zinc deposition stripping. And the positive side, we can utilize the first thing. Uh, and then the uh, potential gap is 1.13 volt. And we first started the solution chemistry of this compound. You can see this is the uh, IR of the solution at the different concentrations. We can see with the concentration increase, the, all those uh, function groups, uh, the peaks for the function groups showed uh, uniformly uh, shift. The same thing also happened on the, um, uh, the proton MR. You can see with the concentration increase, all of the uh, the proton signals on the uh, in the molecular show the uh, similar trend of the shift. So that means with the two sulfonyl groups in the molecular, the uh, hydrogen bonding between the sulfonyl group and the water and the water, water servant lead to a uniform uh, servation structure of this. Uh, uh, entire molecules. It is good for the uh, electrochemical chemical utilization because this uniform conservation can avoid the formation of the missile at a high concentration. So it can significantly increase the electrochemical chemical kinetics of the molecules under a high concentration. Uh, we also tested the uh, first thing cast using this uh, uh, symmetric half cell setup. Uh, you can see it is a very stable in 400 uh, charge discharge cycles. It showed um, very stable cycling performance, no capacity decay was observed. And the analyzed side, the zinc deposition draping, it also showed uh, perfect stability. You can see here is the comparison with the zinc bromide uh, sort. And uh, our uh, first thing for uh, zinc sort showed a much better stability in the uh, zinc stripping deposition cycles in the flow batteries. And, uh, after, uh, and we also did not see the zinc dendrite formation during the um, zinc deposition. This is the SEM image, and this is the picture of the control uh, control current deposit uh, zinc layers. The surface are very uh, smooth. So we uh, demonstrated the zinc, uh, the iron zinc flow battery at one uh, more uh, concentration. Under this concentration, it is twenty. Uh, what our per liter is the same as the commercialized uh, uh, bladem redox flow batteries. And uh, this battery, they can uh, operate at up to 200 milliampere per square centimeter current density, and they can achieve uh, more than 80% energy efficiency and uh, 270 more. Uh, milliwatts per square centimeter uh, power densities. And uh, the stability is perfect. You can see after 2000 uh, charge discharge cycles and uh, 
uh, 54 days, the capacity did not show any decay. We further uh, increased the uh, energy density of this battery by removing the electronite tank at the negative side because the, the zinc have a very high uh, energy, uh, very high capacity, and also in the middle they use a porous membrane as the uh, separator, so the zinc can deposit and uh, uh, deposition and uh, stripping without the tank because when the zinc was deposited, the zinc chitin in this side can migrate into the uh, other side to support the redox uh, reaction at the other side. We did not need to uh, worry about the, the consumption of the zinc chitin. And uh, the advantage for this uh, battery setup is because we only need one solution, so the um, energy density can be doubled. And uh, actually, for example, the same one more uh, single flow battery, it can give uh, 30 watt hour per meter, uh, uh, 40 watt hour per meter energy density. And uh, But the problem is because this side, the uh, the electrolyte is not flowing, so we cannot obviously uh, operate the battery at a high uh, energy, a high current density. So here is the battery we uh, set up. Use uh, one more single flow battery and use uh, uh, ten milliampere per square centimeter uh, current density. It also gives us a very good uh, cycling stability, and uh, we can uh, get up to 86% uh, energy uh, density. Oh, sorry, this one actually is the, uh, the energy density is only 30 watt hour per liter because this, uh, this battery actually, the volume we use in the in, Zinc side is just half of the volume of the person side. So, based on this setup, it is only 1.5 times of the energy density of the first uh, uh, dual flow batteries. And this battery, if we compare with the literature reported zinc organic flow batteries or other organic redox flow batteries, this was this. Uh, um, iron zinc batteries that show the best performance in terms of the, the operated current densities because here we can operate the battery at up to 200 uh, milliampere per square centimeter and the, uh, the uh, demonstrated cycle numbers that we can achieve 150 uh, We can achieve uh, uh, we can achieve thirty, and the power density is uh, the power density actually it is also uh, highest. Here we can achieve two hundred and seventy millivolt per square centimeter. So actually, this battery is uh, the uh, showed the best uh, performance among all of the organic redox blue batteries. So to summarize, in this uh, work, we have developed a biology analyte and a first encapsulate for pH neutral iron or chitin exchange aqueous uh, organic redox blue batteries. And we achieved the high current up to, uh, up to 200 milliampere per centimeter and the high power performance up to uh, 270 millivolts uh, per 
a milliwatt per square centimeter and a perfect uh, cyclic stability at the pitch seven. This performance uh, makes those uh, batteries promising for large scale energy storage. And our magnetic uh, understandings and the structure performance relationship uh, studies are the key to develop robust redox of uh, molecules for the uh, uh, flow battery application and other actually it can also be used to uh, for the development of other uh, energy storage uh, systems yeah finally i will introduce our uh, research uh, groups uh, the, uh, our, my PI is Dr. Kim Myung Liu, and my colleague is uh, Dr. Bo Hu and Camden, uh, Kevin, Maui, Nipin, and Wenda. All of them are uh, supported those uh, uh, research and worthy uh, funding support to our for our research. Okay, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to have uh, any questions from you. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Um, so we will jump straight into the questions here. Uh, uh -huh. So the first one, uh, you, you touched on it a little bit, but I'll go ahead and ask it just so you can kind of um, add on anything you might want to add. Um, are there any concerns with stability of the organic electrolyte? Um, yeah, actually, uh, for example, yeah, that actually is the stability is one of the biggest concern of the uh, redox, uh, uh, the organic redox flow battery. Mm -hmm. But uh, for example, the methodology, the stability is very good. It can achieve uh, about four more in pure water. And uh, after we functionalize it with ammonium uh, groups, mm -hmm. even uh, with a big conjugation system, this molecular sustainability can also reach 1.5 uh, more. And uh, for example, this temple compound, this one, the sustainability, uh, I remember it is about 3.5 more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, yeah. After that means after the molecular structure uh, functionalized, they can serve the uh, sustainability problem. And actually, this is also one of the uh, uh, strategy we use in the organic molecules. For example, the temple itself, just as the bottom redox active part, it is it cannot dissolve in water. But after we uh, introduced uh, hydrophobic, uh, hydrophonic ammonium groups into the molecular, we can achieve high solubility. Yeah, that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the solubility actually it is a problem for organic molecules, but it was so one of the direction we want to serve. That that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, what are yeah? So that kind of leads into this next question. What are the next steps to further improve these flow batteries? Um. Actually, I think the for the uh, in my opinion, there are. Uh, two directions. The first is uh, develop new and uh, more robust organic molecules because right now they still have some have problems. The first one is the cell voltage is not uh, very high. Mm -hmm. They can develop new molecules with a higher potential and achieve a high uh, uh, battery voltage. Mm -hmm. And the Second one is the new molecules can be more stable, and uh, it cannot uh, uh, cross over the uh, ion conducti conductive membrane. So it can make the can give high energy density and high stability. And the second and the second uh, direction, in my opinion, is the membrane, because. For example, this um, for example, this soft functionalized biology compound, 
itself, this Sabinian is already very good, and the Sabinian was so good enough for energy storage. But the only problem is the crossover of the, this compound and the, the related calcite. Mm -hmm. So if we can develop more robust membrane to avoid the crossover of those materials, mm -hmm. and the, we can directly utilize these uh, robust moleculars and achieve good uh, uh, um, the I think it is a usable redox flow battery. Yeah, I think this is the true direction to go, in my opinion. Okay, uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit on the the use cases? So, so I'm assuming flow batteries, you know, are are good batteries for certain situations and not as not as useful in other situations. So, what kind of um, what what are the, what are they best utilized to do? Um, yeah, actually, there are two uh, utilized. The first one is and we uh, see here. Yeah, because there is a time gap between the solar energy uh, production and the electricity usage. Mm -hmm. So. At the new one, the solar pair will generate the electricity, but in our house, we did not need to use the electricity. So we can keep the electricity in this battery. Mm -hmm. And at the afternoon or evening, we can use this electricity. This is the first part of the, the first usage of a flow battery. And the second, uh, use of the flow battery is because we want to uh, not just uh, develop the renewable energy, especially the solar energy and the wind energy uh, in large scales. But this um, energy actually it is not continuous. Sometimes it generates the electricity, sometimes it stopped because the weather, the uh, will affect is the electricity generation. So this uh, electricity wave, if we directly connect into our electricity grid, it will be very uh, dangerous because one big wave of the electricity pump into the electricity grid, it may damage the electricity grid. So we need to use a large-scale energy storage device to make the uh, non-continuous electricity generator mm -hmm. connect to our electricity grid. Yeah, this is the second usage of the uh, redox flow batteries. Okay, now that that makes a lot of sense too. Now, mm -hmm. in terms of the the discharge um, capabilities. What is it? Is our redox flow batteries limited in terms of the current density that, that they are? I guess the I, I don't maybe I don't, I don't think I know the right terminology, but but is it are are they affected by the rate at which you're discharging the batteries? Uh, you mean the the stability? Yeah, or, or I guess like in terms of the cycling. Um, Capabilities, um, right? So, so if if you discharge at let's say a low current density, I'm mm -hmm. assuming that, I'm assuming that you can get, you know, you have better stability over a longer number of cycles versus if you do a higher current density, then you know, do, do you see uh, let do you do you see a faster loss of the cycling uh, capacity and all of that? Um, actually, in our battery system, the the biggest uh, pathway for the uh, battery decay mm -hmm. is because of the decomposition of the compound or the crossover of the material. Oh. So the decomposition and the crossover rate actually it is uh, time, demand, uh, time dependent. So if you use a large current to charge discharge the battery, 
each cycle, it only needs a short time. Actually, you will say the battery is the most stable. If you, mm. you charge the discharge, Oh, I think I might have lost you there. Hang on. You still there? Super based. Oh. It, it will be more reliable. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, that, that I guess that yeah, that's interesting because I know, or at least I think I know, in uh -huh. in in like lithium ion batteries, if you do mm -hmm. you know if you do the fast not yeah yeah the fast charge and discharge, they tend to run down much more quickly over time. Uh huh. And it sounds like yeah, in that case, maybe at a high current, the uh, even user uh, user the uh, they need some danger to the home or mm -hmm. some other side reaction well. Happen. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so so here here operating at, or charging and discharging at higher current densities, you you do the charging and the discharging faster, so you actually minimize your crossover, which is yeah. turn kind of so you, so it actually kind of helps you a little bit. That's interesting. Uh -huh. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah so if uh, we report to this divinity, just uh, use the site number based. Uh, Stability actually it is cheating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. That's good. That's, okay, that's good to know. I'll watch out for that. <laughs> well, very good. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have. So I will say thank mm -hmm. you again uh, to to you, Dr. Lo. Uh, this was yeah. a really interesting talk. It's a fascinating work. Um, you know, I, I have a, a very passing familiarity with with flow batteries, so it's it's really neat to see. Um, what what sort of the the cutting edge of the of this new technology is? Um, so I, I really appreciate you coming on and and sharing the work that you've been doing uh, with us. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you to build up this uh, platform for us to share our work. Oh, happy to. This is, like I said, I, I really enjoy doing it. Um, so let me get you to hang on for just one minute. We'll talk very briefly. Um, for everybody yeah. else, we have one more talk. It will be at 2 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Um, so if you're a night owl like me, or maybe you're, uh, you know, in a time zone that, that is <laughs> conducive <laughs> to being here at 2 a.m., uh, please feel free to come back out. We'll have one more talk. It uh -huh. should be very interesting. And um, thank uh -huh. you to everybody who's been listening so far. Um, so yeah. I'll see you in a couple of hours, everyone. Yeah. Okay. See you guys.